Just over four years ago, I built this Saxon-inspired Grubenhaus, a pit house, with my dad, here out in this coniferous forest. At the time, I really didn't have much knowledge of traditional building skills and experimental archaeology, and to be honest, it all was an experiment. I've come back here now, four years later, to give you an insight into how it's actually looking, where it's weathered, things that I did well and I thought I was quite proud of, and things that maybe we could have improved on given that it's now four years later and there's certainly some things that are not as good as I thought they would hold up. Essentially we started the build by digging a pit, a hole, in the ground and this was known as a Grubenhaus and it was inspired by the kind of mainland Europe Grubenhauses which were built into these pits and we don't exactly know why but around back then so we can only really kind of guess why they might have built them in holes and there's different theories some such as it will maintain a more consistent temperature throughout the year because it's not affected as much by the external elements where you've got that hole. The theory is, is that in the summer months it's going to be cooler because you've got the earth around you and in the winter months it's going to be warmer when you've got a fire in there. Those earth walls will help to bounce that heat back and just well retain, retain the heat. And I have certainly from experience found that that definitely does work. It's a very consistent temperature in there all year round, especially in the summer months when it's lovely and cool. So we dug the pit and that was uh, quite, quite a labour intensive job, but it's good fun and you know you learn along the way. And then we made a timber frame using pine. As you can see the woodland behind me is full of Scots pine trees and where they're so dense they've grown lovely and straight. And so we had some really good pine resources and we peeled the bark off these using a peeling jig and a draw knife just because it helped to reduce the chance of bugs eating under the bark and rotting it away. And then I did do some traditional woodworking techniques and made some mortise and tenon joints, which uh, again, I was fairly new to. Um, and we, we sealed those joints, interestingly, with some pine pitch glue, which I'd melted up, or pine pitch, uh, which is basically the resin from the pine tree that I'd melted up in a tin and then placed that on top of the mortise and tenon joints to, to seal them because these joints went all, the, the tenons went all the way through the mortise. And really, I probably would have made it so that they didn't go all the way through. They just kind of went three quarters of the way through. And that way, the top of the joint was still protected from rain by the, the wood itself. In hindsight, that's something I would have changed. Once we did that, we got all round wood rafters and we secured those all to the A-frame itself once that ridge pole was up. And then it was on to the wattle and daub, which was these walls here. So we'd weaved these sticks in and out of the these vertical posts that we placed all along these side walls here. And then we got a mixture of clay and straw uh, and a bit of wood, uh, wood ash, stamped it all together, mashed it up in, inside a, a hole at the back of the shelter. We dug a pit and we mashed it all together there. And then we slapped it on nice and thick where we could all the way along so that the daub mix would go in between the sticks and then eventually set and dry hard. Once we'd done that, we worked on here which is the gable ends. And again, we just used round wood pine and we just stacked them up horizontally and pinched them in between the wolf posts. Now, again, in hindsight, I probably would have done this more of a vertical structure. I think with a lot of Saxon things, they actually hewed up the wood and they would have made it much more, um, you know, thinner wood, but bigger pieces and made them a vertical shape. Instead, we did it horizontal because it's just what we had here. We weren't cutting down giant pine trees. We were just using a lot of the dead wood that was all around. So once we'd done the gable ends, then it was onto the exciting part, which was the thatched roof. And here it is, my first ever time thatching. Never done it before in my life. I just did some research. I got some water reed and I just gave it a go. And to be honest, for a first attempt at thatching, I was really quite pleased with how it came out. Some of the things I would have changed with how I did it are over this end here, which I'll show you now where we started the thatch itself. You probably can't see because of the, the type of the camera angle that I've got here, but this is where we started laying the first pieces of thatch, the first yelms, the round of thatch. And the problem was I ended up putting it far too thick here. And that meant I started to run out of thatch as I got towards the top of the ridge. Um, we carried on with dad, we carried on as we did anyway this side and we noticed we were getting through a lot of thatch and there was going to be a hell of a lot of weight on what is really quite a small, thin, round wood frame. So we were a little bit concerned, but we went with it anyway, and four years later, it's still really solid. Once we got to the other side, 
we started to do it a lot thinner and it was much, much easier to work with. So here's the other side and you can actually still see the layers of where we had each yarn when we layered it up. And this side, we didn't blend it in as much so you can get these clear lines of where we put each row of thatch. It was much better this side because we'd had a whole day and a half of doing it that side. However, you can still see near the top here, it thins out and really it should have kept that thickness all the way up to the ridge. But I was learning, it was my first time ever thatching and we, we, we were first time using the spars. So what we do is we use these hazel spars. I'll put a link to a video actually, where you can learn how to make hazel spars, which I filmed a few weeks ago with a friend of mine called Ben. I'll link it up here or in the description below. Essentially, they're like these wooden chopsticks that pin the thatch to these horizontal ligers, which were like thin pieces of ash, which pin it then to the rafters and then all the thatch stays in place. Again, it was my first time doing this. I had no experience. But you know me on my channel, I'm really hands-on and I'm really happy to give it a go and learn along the way. I feel like that's the best way of learning is giving it a go and learn from your mistakes. And I was much more pleased with this side than I was the first side. Hey, the thatch is still holding up though four years later. What's interesting though is this. I'm not so sure if you guys can see this or not, but in amongst this brown thatch where it's seasoned off really lovely and there's all debris on it at the moment, pine needles and leaves. But in amongst it, you can spot these bright green patches, and I've only noticed this today, four years later, that there is actually moss, species of moss. It looks like sphagnum moss, but there is moss now growing on the thatch, which is absolutely awesome. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see, and I guess that's because I haven't ever raked any of the debris off this for four years. You know, in hindsight, for better maintenance, I should have kept raking off the debris just to help prolong the life of it. But at the same time, if all this gets lovely and thick with debris and, and leaves that die back and things like that, it's almost gonna act like a compost and moss and things like that will start to grow and it will actually help to insulate the thatch even more, I reckon, although it would affect the water flow and the rain flow coming off. But that's really interesting. Look, there's more up here. Here you go, look, there's more moss starting to grow up here. It's lovely and green and vivid, bright green. I don't know if the camera's doing it justice, but that's really cool. Four years later, I have living moss growing on the roof and I didn't even put it there in the first place. It's just done it naturally. Once myself and dad had finished, the thatch roof itself will basically run out of thatch. You can see it gets much thinner towards the top. It should have carried on that thickness. It then came to doing the ridge and I intertwined two yelms together like that lashed them together and it made a big long tube and essentially that was going to sit on the ridge pole to in between the rafters that were doing this v-shape to basically create a solid platform for the thatch to then lean up against and create that more of a kind of rounded ridge again all new to me i just read up on it and apparently that's what you do <laughs> but it made me realize when i did it can you see this dip so it, it, it kind of starts thick up there and then it dips down over there and then it dips up again and then it dips down and I don't know whether that's where it's been weathered over time and it's done that and it's shifted and moved but a part of me thinks when I was doing it I remember seeing it being up and down like this the ridge and thinking that that fat should be not that ridge sort of uh, tube should be really nice and straight and it unfortunately it wasn't and that's how the ridge came out so it looks really odd it's got a bit of character to it but I can tell you now that the inside is absolutely bone dry and always has been for four years. Just goes to show how incredible thatch is as a material, water reed, for example, like this. Uh, and looking at the thatch itself, obviously it's a, it's a much darker color now because it's been weathered, it's been exposed to the elements for over four years. And although it looks like it's rotting, it's not, it's actually just discoloration. There is a lot of debris on here that I probably need to sweep off with a broom. But other than that, it's been raining today and it's still shedding water, no problem. And, you know, four years later, I'm really pleased with that. That's good. I mean, thatching on, on housing is still done today here in England, in Britain. Uh, and it's, it, it's, you know, they last 40, 40 odd years before you need to get your roof rethatched. And even then, they don't rethatch the whole roof now. They can cleverly, like, just thatch different areas or just do the ridge. So yeah, that's, that's still one of my greatest achievements is the first time ever thatching. And there is a roundhouse that I built with my friend Dustin where I had massively improved on my thatching skills. That was a year or two later than this one. 
and uh, I'll do that in a separate video with Dustin at some point. But this is, yeah, I was really pleased with the outcome of and learning about the thatching. And for me, it was probably the best experience. I don't think dad would say the same. He's not here today. I was going to get him to come over. He probably didn't enjoy the thatching as much as I did, but we certainly didn't enjoy the dig in the hole. Anyway, let's take a look at the back and then we'll go inside. Here's a good example. This is the first area of thatch that I laid and you can see how thick it is. It's far too thick for this, the size of the structure. And it went so much thinner up there when we finally realized, oh, we've done it too thick. So I would say start with a sort of thinner consistency and, and maintain that consistency all the way through the top of the ridge. And then you get that nice shape an even shape. But this is the back, the back gable end. Again, this time we went vertical and we weaved the wattle and daub. We did, we did it slightly different and we did a lower section of wattle and daub. And then we just used some vertical Scots pine branches really up here and we also did some chinking with some moss I'll show you so you can see this is the moss and I didn't actually put any um, clay cob material over the top of this like I did at the front which I'll show you in a minute but the moss has all died you know it's all it's all died back which is fine remember wedging it in with a stick and it's actually pinched in really well and it just stops all the draft and the wind from piling into the uh, into this end of the, the Saxon house. It's one of my favorite discoveries today and I never really realized it at the time, but at the back end of the, the, the gable end of the Saxon house here, we really kind of felt like we bodged this with the, the clay, you know, it just been really, uh, just a bit of a basic job. We were running out of clay, we just dumped it all on. We never made it kind of an even thickness and smooth. But what is really cool is that you can actually see our finger marks here. All along here, there's just finger marks. And I quite like that we left that as finger marks and not smoothed off with our palm. Because in years to come, you know, we can look at this and, and kids, my kids can look at it and dad's grandkids, they could look at it and, and see that actually that's dad's, dad's and granddad's fingers that had, uh, had built this little back wall here. It just adds so much more character, so much more meaning to it. And although it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing as a nice smooth face, it's almost like discovering a cave painting or something, you know, of primitive man and thinking, wow, someone did that hundreds of thousands, well, thousands of years ago, of primitive man. And maybe someone in years to come will look at that and go, wow, someone did that hundreds of years ago. I don't know, it's, it's the little things, isn't it? One thing as well that I've noticed is really interesting is you can see this green coloration down here on the wattle and door, obviously where the water has hit from the rain over the years, uh, where this gable end doesn't extend out at all. And it, again, that's something I probably would have changed going back now is I would have definitely had these, these rafters and these purlins coming out a bit more just to give an overhang so that this whole wattle and daub area is then protected from the rain because at the moment it's really exposed and it has been for four years and whilst it's held up really well in hindsight i would have definitely have extended the poles out here to help protect all of the clay down there to just make it last longer it's all been a learning experience and i'm really pleased four years later it's still just as solid i mean look it doesn't move <laughs> there's a lot of weight of thatch up there it doesn't move and it's been absolutely solid through some really strong storms over the years so this is what i mean by the overhang so i, I did the overhang down here on the rafters and as a result this wattle and door wall has been totally protected from the elements and it's a lot more solid and less crumbly this is what i needed to do on this gable end and the front gable end to help protect them from the elements a little bit more and you can kind of see a similar thing here now with this, this front gable end, I actually put some moss, filled, infilled all the gaps with moss, and then put that clay cob mixture on the top of it. And that's actually dried off really well. It's a little bit spongy in places where probably I used too much moss and the clay mixture, the daub mixture, sorry, didn't have anything to stick to as much. So it's a little bit spongy. It does the job, you know, it does the job. It's just, yeah, in hindsight, I maybe would have gone with something a bit more vertical, some planks and stuff to make it look a little bit more authentic and Saxon like and then we built the window and the door. I remember doing this window as a project and I wanted to build it using no metal nails at all. I wanted to try and build it all using wood pegs and just a knife and some very minimal tools. And obviously we we made a box frame to begin with. And then I made these little hinges with some wood dowels, which I, wood pegs, sorry, which I stuck in there. And then I augured 
a hole in the tips up here. And then I had some little wood dowels that I whittled and they would stick on these, which would stick on the window. But the windows, I think, somewhere strewn around the forest where we'd found people at the camp who had broken into the cabin uh, nearby and the window's gone somewhere. I need to try and find it. Um, and then I'd, I'd, I'd hewed up some of the woods with a small axe some of the wood sorry and then we burnt the wood and it was a really nice cool project it took me so long it took me best part of a day and a half and um yeah and it worked it opened and it closed at the moment it's really open inside but obviously because there's no window but it was a good project again and it's not really saxon orientated but it was nice to have a little window at the front and to do something with hand tools again and it was onto the door and myself and my dad had a bit of a battle over the door because originally Dad had made a door from pallet wood. You guys know my dad. He loves using pallet wood. And so we'd made this pallet wood door. And we'd, we'd built it and it looked okay. And the frame at the time was a bit lower. I think the door was a bit higher so that we didn't bang our heads. But after a while I looked at it and I thought, we've come this far with the Saxon house and we've gone and used kind of pallet wood and it just didn't look right. So a few, I don't know when it was, a few months later, maybe even a year later, uh, we sorted a proper door. We've got some lovely big oak planks I think these are and we I, I did a video with a friend of mine called Alex Pohl who's a blacksmith in Somerset and he showed me how to make medieval style nails um, well I say medieval just really really traditional way of making nails they're big nails they were like this with a big head to them and he showed me how to forge them we hand forged the nails he taught me that I'll link that to the video in the description below and then we built this door and it's so much better we burnt off the wood on a campfire and it just looks like a much more authentic door. It's a lot heavier, so we had to use some quite big hinges, but it looked great. And I was so much more pleased with this door. However, things I would change and add. I'm currently using a bit of string and a peg for the door. I'd much rather have a nice handle and a latch on there, wood latch, and a nice wooden handle or a metal handle. Um, and we, this is another bugbear of mine. I ended up painting the frame black here with this like black tar paint and I kind of regret that I don't really know why I did it I think it was to make the door frame blend in a bit more but actually it almost looked a bit too cartoony at the time if I could change anything on this Saxon house it would definitely be the whole front end here what I did is I built we built it as an a-frame with this post in the middle that post goes all the way down to the ground in hindsight, I would have built it as a box A-frame, so a square, so a post here, a post here, a post across there, and then have a central doorway and not a doorway off to the side. It would have made for much more headroom going into the door. It would have looked symmetrically much better. And I then would have used the vertical planks for the gable ends. That's definitely something I would have changed on this project. But it was four years ago and it's one of my first kind of big builds. Still super pleased with it. Let's go and take a look inside. And this is the inside of the Saxon house. Now, you can see where the moss has come through the gaps there. It's, it was way more sealed than that four years ago, I promise you. Um, it's, yeah, it's not really doing much, but it is letting some light in. But you can see all the water reed the actual seed heads of the water reed is still here not rotting away now there are some bugs there's lots of spider webs there's lots of moths from the looks of it but that's okay um, it's only because i've not had fires in here for so long and the smoke would normally drive all those bugs away if i was doing it regularly but look at the, the rafters they're absolutely immaculate they're in such good condition there's no rot there whatsoever there's none of them are snapped they're all straight and the thatch is so thick that the rain just can't get through at all. You can't feel the wind, it's great. And you can see now why we dug down or why they would dig them down in a pit. Because look how much extra room you get in terms of height. So I guess that was another reason they dug in pits is it meant that they could use way less resources above the ground, way less cutting and sawing and, and chopping with wood um, and use you know just the, the ground itself going down. I did have a fire pit here in a ring. I have to remake it. Over here was my was the bed. Um, I've ended up using some of this wood for other projects down the line. 
but lovely lovely big bed there was loads of space i think i need to rebuild this bed what do you guys think a bed here it's big in here you know it's a lot bigger than i remembered a lot bigger than i remembered there is a lot we could do in here still there's so much space but you can see where we hadn't used loads of the door mixture that some of the sticks that we weaved in are still exposed i think it adds a bit of character but in hindsight, if you're going to do a proper job of it, you'd need to really cack it on there and layer it on there. We just ran out of clay because it's not clay soil up here. We had to dig clay from a different area. That, that was the sort of depth above the ground. That's the bottom of the ground here where my hand is. And then we went, we dug down about 18 inches, 20 inches extra. So we have, you know, four foot of depth probably. You can see these logs here actually helped give us a bit more height as well. When we dug down and we put these logs on the side, it just gave us a bit more height to work with. And we used loads of clay here. I remember Dad throwing it on there and getting it in his face. It was great fun. Big, it was a bigger project than we thought. But again, another regret of mine is that we spent so much time building this. I think it was a 12 day build overall, but over the period of a few months, 12 days worth of work. We spent so much time building it and I never really settled in if you know what i mean i never really built the furniture that i was going to build in here you know build the bed i did i did a few overnights and they were great but i never really used it and i never got the time to use it and it's only looking back now four years later that i realized i missed out on so many opportunities of being able to enjoy it and it's the same with a lot of the structures i've built the viking house i got a bit more use out with dustin and same with the roundhouse that still gets used but with this one, I just never really used it as much as I should have done. And so I think I'm going to come back here and maybe redesign the front a bit, but certainly fill in some of the gaps at the back and just build some furniture things here, build a much better raised bed, get a good fire pit going and just enjoy it because the structure itself isn't going anywhere. It's absolutely solid, but it makes sense to just use it. All that effort for 12 days and I've barely used it inside. So that's another of my regrets. We can live and learn, eh? That's the front gable end. But look at these rafters. They're in such good condition still. You can see all my like draw knife marks. Brings back memories. And there's that pole that I would have that pole there is what I would have removed and I would have just gone straight down there, straight down there and had a box frame and not had that pole in the middle. Then I could have had a central door left over from the bed. This is the fire pit, which only got used a few times. I need to rebuild the fire pit and make it all new again. Rebuild the bed. I'm thinking bed, bedside table, bit of furniture over there. Fill in all the gaps. This is the peeling jig that we built, that we used. It wasn't in this area when we originally built the Saxon House, but this is what we used with the draw knife to peel the bark off the rafters for all of the rafters and for all of the timber frame. And it's, it's rotting now, but I think it would still work. So what you would do is you would rest your long piece of wood on this V, and then you'd put the butt end of it up against here, which has a U shape to stop it pulling out. And then you would just get your draw knife and pull this way and peel all the bark off and this would stop your logs slipping like that way but it's rotten now obviously where it's water sat on it but it's still standing that's our peeling jig which we use to make all of these rafters for this here is the pit the hole that we dug the clay dug in the clay and the wattle and daub mix you can almost see a bit of the clay still there look at that the clay is still there that we used Fun fact, there is some wood stored here at the back of the Saxon House. Saxon House is just there. This wood here is the OG wood, the original wood from the Bushcraft Camp. Who remembers that series? It's still there. It's pretty rotten now, but it's still there. It's the memories, guys. It's the memories. Let me know if you remember that series. One other thing that I definitely would have added is, is kind of like some shutter board, some just boarding for this gable end all the way up here and all the way down there, just so you don't see, well, two reasons, to cover the gap in the thatch 
and the, that goes from the thatch to the rafters here there's always a gap and it just lets lots of airflow in so it would cover that but it would also mean that you don't seal this side of the thatching here there's a much kind of more aesthetic look to it with a, some flat boarding there so I, I definitely would have changed that as well but you know four years later can I say that I'm proud of the structure that me and dad built definitely it was it was amazing memories it was really good uh, you guys absolutely loved it at that time and if you want to watch every episode of the individual series the Saxon House build it's called TA Outdoors Saxon House on YouTube I'll link it in the description below and all our thought process going through it things have changed a lot since then four years ago I've had two children now three-year-old girl and coming up a one-year-old boy um, I've moved house twice it yeah lots has changed YouTube itself has changed it's a different beast now but you know they were the best times and yeah I'm really really proud of what myself and dad built there and if you do want to check out dad's channel it's called TA Fishing go and help him out he gave me massive help on this build here you guys can uh, go and give him some support go subscribe to TA Fishing he's got some really good videos on there but I think I will be back here and hopefully do some more overnighters, tidy it up, do some really cool things and just enjoy it more. That's what it's about, enjoying it more. Not just the ah, build, 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 which is like what you see so much of on YouTube now. And it's, I don't know, it's saturated a bit now, don't you think? The build stuff on YouTube, like it's great and I love doing it, but I feel like it's detracted from what its original purpose was years ago. It's a bit of a different ball game now. Anyway, I digress. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I do appreciate it, guys. If you enjoyed it, feel free to subscribe. Uh, and if you want to follow the series, I'll put it in the description below. Oh, and I'm going to go and visit the other structures that I've built and see how they've gone four years later. Because I think we've got the, the Viking house that I did with Dustin, uh, the turf roof Viking house I've got here, the pallet wood cabin. You guys are waiting for that, an update on the pallet wood cabin, which is the oldest structure that we've built. So I don't know, it's something that's really nice to come back here and reflect on what I did who I did it with, the experience at the time. You guys can also reflect a lot of you because you followed me from those years back to where I'm at now. And you, you know, you can learn from me and my mistakes. And it's just a nice nostalgic journey to have in amongst obviously the new content that's gonna be coming out soon as well. So thank you for watching folks. And I'll see you in the next episode.